I built incredible empathy and a sense I appreciate the privilege of being the boss. And I, you know, I can tell you, if you ask my, the teams who'd worked with me before I had kids, I was definitely that like tone deaf leader Same. that was like, let's do the meeting at six o'clock. You know, I'm like, oh, let's just get on like the call at six o'clock, not realizing like that's the window and you get to, people get to see their kids. Myths of being a CEO or a leader. I mean, you know, it's obviously not never as glamorous as it might seem. It's a lot of pressure and responsibility. The two things that I didn't realize um, that probably have forced me to evolve the most. One is it's, and people say this, it's a very lonely job. And, you know, I was such a, I loved being part of the team. I loved feeling like we were equals on a playing field. And ultimately, when you become the boss, you don't get the luxury of doing that. And part of your job is to, to make hard decisions that no one else should be making, that no one else can make. And part of your job is to be comfortable not being popular and not being well-liked all the time. And that was probably the, one of the hardest transitions. The other one is recognizing that when you become the boss, you lose some of the honesty and openness that you once enjoyed with your team. There's a power dynamic there. And you can be the most accessible, friendly, um, team-oriented leader in the world. But People will filter a little bit what they say to you because you are their boss and you determine their like their job and their compensation and their career path. And for a while, I wanted to ignore that power dynamic and just like pretend it didn't exist, but it very much does. And that has led me over the years to really embrace this idea of tr very explicitly trying to surround myself with people on my executive team who are just... I like to say I like to hire people who don't need the job and who mm -hmm. don't think of themselves as my as like an employee, partly because they'll just they're more likely to tell me what they think, to disagree with me, to call out my bullshit, to pull me aside and be like, you screwed that up. And I have just found that to be such a better way to operate and be successful. So I find that I have to combat that all the time. And if I don't create an environment where people feel super comfortable then just the natural inertia is, it's very hard to dip, to actually have a pulse on what's happening because people just, they, they naturally filter. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I'll hear women, uh, the question I get, often get asked is like, how do you do it with two children and be in this role? <laughs> and that's, that's also the myth I want to dispel. I think that like getting to the CEO role is actually the best thing you can do because then you own your own schedule, you have more flexibility. You have the experience from which to set policies and to, you know, establish a different way of operating and culture. And so I think that uh, actually having a CEO title for me has been a gift from a parenting perspective in a lot of ways. I, I felt, inc I built incredible empathy and a sense I appreciate the privilege of being the boss. And I, you know, I can tell you, if you ask my, the teams who'd worked with me before I had kids. I was definitely that like tone deaf leader Same. that was like, let's do the meeting at six o'clock. You know, I'm like, oh, let's just get on like the call at six o'clock, not realizing like that's the window <laughs> and you get to, people get to see their kids. And I, I really feel like going through the experience um, of becoming a mother and, you know, right now my life is complete chaos at home. It's like, you know, the classic stuff. And I think it makes me so much more empathetic to the needs of others on my team um, and I agree with you. Like I, I've, uh, people always ask how you do it. And I always say, it's so much easier for me than most of the people that work with me because I, I do have that privilege of, of having more control and, and often more resources, even with all of that can barely keep it together. So I just can't, you know, I, I have so much empathy for what it's like. And I think there's a ton we have to do, particularly in the United States. Um, to really kind of create the right institutional support for mothers. I think there's an extremely compelling economic argument to do so. It's something we don't talk about enough because it's a struggle for all of us and kids. No matter how much infrastructure you have around it and how much care you have, it's still hard um, on the parents because there are just too many demands. Yeah. You know, and I, I think you know, there's like also this, you have to recognize that we all are showing up to work with all of those stresses yes. and just give people grace yes. more to be like, 
Like I've found more and more recently, like there, you know, you can kind of normalize and create a culture where people are just more comfortable being like, I'm sorry. I just had this like completely crazy morning. I'm barely like able to focus, like just give me a minute and kind of just create a little bit more of the openness. The other thing that I think is really interesting is like, it's not just, you know, things like support from others. It's also just recognizing that there's a lot of partners that also, I think more, more and more, if we create the support and we destigmatize things like, you know, parental leave and, and all of these things, there's also ways that you can create more support structures. Um, so it's not also all on the mother yeah. <laughs> to both be great at work and at home.